Controlling people can show up anywhere in your life. Romance, friendships, work, or your good old dad. Sometimes these people are well-meaning, but it's driving you crazy. They're always telling you what to do, and there are two ways of doing things, their way and the wrong way. They say they're just trying to be helpful, but you often walk away feeling resentful, frustrated, drained, or even depressed. Well, today we're gonna turn that around. In this episode, you'll learn the six main categories of controlling behaviors and my top tools for dealing with each one. So stay tuned. Well, hi, welcome back. Good to see you. It is I, your loving host, Dr. Abby Metcalf. If you're watching me on YouTube, hello, subscribe, like, leave a comment. Tell me how much you like my sweater and my jewelry, something. Uh, it's great to see you. Great to be here. Um, today, of course, uh, you know, back when I was little, they had these very special episodes, these after school specials. Um, they were called, they called them very special episodes where, you know, something a little deeper, something a little more like, oh, we got to talk about, you know, drug addiction or, uh, or um, abuse or something. But today we're getting deep on, on Abby. Yes, we are. Because today is about controlling people. And as you know, I am a control enthusiast. I, this is the thing I come back to a lot. And I think most of us do actually. So I did um, an episode on controlling people way back in the first um, season of the podcast. So I think it's episode like 29. And I know a lot of you can't access those. You can always access everything on my website, but I also, of course, because that was years ago, I want to update it, right? I want to give new information. And I came up with these six categories. I did a lot of work around this and I've been doing a lot of work around it with my clients. So uh, I'm actually really excited to talk about this today, even if I might embarrass myself at different points, but you'll be patient with me and still love me, right? Okay, so... And I'll link to those original episodes. And I think I'm going to do a second part to this where like today it's talking about how to deal with controlling people. And next week or soon, I'll talk about how to, what to do if you're a control enthusiast, <laughs> a control freak. Uh, that's how I divided it up years ago. And I think it's a good way to do it now. So today I'm just talking about other people in your life who might be trying to control you. And even us controlling people have people trying to control us. That's just how it works, right? That's life. So. It, I think this always applies to everyone. Um, yeah, okay. So <laughs> yeah, time for an update. Let's talk first about what controlling behavior is. And I, you know, I do a lot of things on a continuum. I like a continuum. You know, if I talk about trust, it's not like, you know, you might trust your partner with certain things and not with other things, but people say, well, I trust my partner or I don't. It's like, well, you know, it's a continuum. You, you might trust them not to cheat, but you might not trust them with sharing their feelings, their true feelings, something like that, right? So trust ends up on a continuum. Everything ends up on a continuum, I think. I think when we get into that very black and white stuff, it gets a little scary. And so I thought to myself, wow, what if controlling behavior was on a continuum? Like, how could I look at that? How could I talk about that? And I thought about all the ways I talk about it with my clients. And I realized it really broke down into some easy categories. So I'm gonna break them down now from the most serious, like one end of, if you think of a line, right? A continuum is usually on a line. If you think of one end or the other end, I'm going to start with number six, uh, number one, which I think is like the most controlling into kind of the most benign or least controlling or, I don't, it's a different kind of controlling. It's a, It might be very controlling, but it might it's a more benign controlling. So. Let's start with that one end of the spectrum, which is really violence or physical or mental abuse. And this is when someone is trying to control your freedom, your autonomy through threats of physical violence or possibly something like, it could be you know controlling your finances in such a way that you're afraid to leave, controlling you through your children, saying that you know they'll hurt the kids or get custody of the kids if you try to leave. Um, that kind of stuff. So this is generally marked by, there's just constant belittling, manipulation, rage, again, and often physical or close to physical, um, or just threats of physicality. This person might try to isolate you from family or friends. They often use a lot of intimidation tactics. And so 
let me say this, that's one end of the spectrum. I'm not talking about that today because that is its huge own category. And if this is you, if you're listening going, oh yeah, I got all those things. I, this is not for you. This, no little podcast listening is, I mean, you can listen today, but please know you need to do, this is on a whole other level. And to me, you would contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline here in the United States. I will link all of that in the show notes or in the country that you live in. Look that up. You, you have something like it in your country. I will almost guarantee, depending on your country. So I don't want you just sort of, you know, kind of lackadaisical listening. Your, your life can be in danger. Certainly your mental health is in grave danger. And I want you to do something more immediately. At the very least, contact a a mental health professional of any kind and see what's going on. But the national hotlines are really, um, especially here in the U.S., I can only talk about, they can help you assess what's happening and sort of guide you safely towards next steps, which is what you would need. So that category, not the tips I'm giving today are not going to work. Just want, So that is my tip for that category, that you get some very serious help. The second category, like step down from that. And by the way, these cat they're on a continuum, right? So things can bleed into an, each other. So that physically violent person might be a narcissist, which is my second category. And, uh, or might not be, it's all kinds of people doing all kinds of things, but so might be in this category too. And there, you know, there's four kinds of narcissism, narcissism. Generally we hear about gaslighting, threats, that kind of thing. And I'm, again, not going to be speaking about dealing with a diagnosed narcissist today, okay? Because I did a podcast on how to deal, learning how to deal with a narcissist. I did signs that someone is gaslighting you and what to do about it. I have early episodes that cover that. As always, I'm just going to say this once. I say it every episode because there's always new listeners, so be patient. But if you come to the website, abbymetcalf.com, go to right there on the top. It says relationship tips and tools, which is the corresponding blog for every podcast episode I do. And all the information links to research, everything is there as well as all the old episodes. Every episode of the podcast is on there. So, um, is on my website. If you can't find it on the, um, you know, Pandora or Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen, you can find it there. And, I also, on the podcast page, if you go to the podcast and go to this episode, you will also find links to everything. So, you know, the the relationship tips and tools is just much more intensive, a lot more links, a lot more things to look at. Um, And I I really, everything I'm saying is kind of written there in note, you know, in a form. Um, Not everything, but most things I'm saying. Okay, so that's those two, right? So that's there. Then the next level down, and again, this can be in one of those other categories, is the third category to me is extreme or unreasonable jealousy. Because, and I, and I'm not, again, a narcissist can be very jealous. Someone who's physically abusive can be very jealous and unreasonable, but it also can stand alone with none of those things. And that's why I'm separating it out because it can show up in a lot of ways. So um, at work, it might be someone who's just very focused on you, doing better than them. Uh, Maybe they, this is the kind of person that will quit, you know, you go in to talk to your boss and you come out and they're quizzing you about it. What'd you talk about? What what happened in there? Uh, They quiz you on details of a project you're working on, you know, um, a controlling, and, and they're jealous, right? They're really jealous and unreasonable about it. And they might spread rumors about you at work and say that you were sucking up to the boss or sleeping with the boss when you weren't or God knows what. Um, and again, that person might not be a narcissist and might not be physically abusive to you, but they are just unreasonably jealous. Um, it, this could show up like a controlling friend who might only want you to be friends with them and will criticize or speak ne- negatively about your other friends you know, that you spend time with to you, right? I had this recently with a client. She has uh, like kind of a best friend, uh, an older friend though, from when she was young, who's, she's been her friend from, you know, decades. And when she, and she has newer friends now, cause you know, we grow up, we change, we have different friends. And this old friend is super jealous of that. And is always talking them down and then talks my client down, you know, you just think you're better than everyone now that you've moved away. And now that you're this and blah, 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 you know, it's really manipulative and mean, frankly. And, but sometimes we stay friends with these people because of, of, uh, you know, 
um, we, we feel duty bound somehow, right? We feel obligated in some way. We think it's loyal to be friends with them. So I know it's terrible, but this, so that could happen there. You could have a jealous partner who maybe they pout or they get upset anytime you spend time with someone other than them, or they're interrogating you about your Instagram account and who you're following or a like you put on a picture or something, you know, they're looking all over. There's just generally a lot of possessiveness here and unreasonable grounds for how they're acting, okay? So again, I'll say, you know, jealousy can be included in those first two categories I mentioned, but it can also be less obvious. So to me, needs its own category. And my tips for jealousy, I'm, again, not gonna go deep here since I already covered what to do if your partner is jealous in a previous post, and that's all linked, okay? You could also look up jealousy on my website. There's a search function on the website. You can look things up. You can look it up also on the platforms you're on, um, listening to the podcast on. So, uh, so I'm not gonna get into that specific with my, I'm giving you a lot of tips today, but they're, you know, I'm, I'm coming down to where the people I'm really wanting to give you tips about today that we're getting out of some of this more, to me, any end of a spectrum, you, you start to get into just outliers, you know, the thing that's not the most common or the thing that needs its own episode, which I've done. So now we're going to get to it episode uh categories four five and six now we're really gonna get to what i'm talking about today and all the tips i'm going to give you today are really focused on these okay again you can get all the other tips from the other podcast episodes for how to deal with gaslighting narcissism uh jealousy all that okay so category number four is just this major judgmental uh critical kind of controller and it, it, you, <laughs> if you're, if right now you're like, oh yeah, these are the people who think there are two ways of doing things, like I mentioned earlier, right? The, the wrong, their way and the wrong way. They tend to come off as somewhat rigid with rules, and they're often it's like super black and white with how they present to the world. Okay, and again, I'm gonna give them my tips at the end. But th these three categories, and again, they can mesh with each other, but. Category number five is the bossy or micromanaging controller. So yeah, so a more, this to me is the more kind of normal controlling person, the more usual controlling person, uh, tends to be kind of bossy or directive. They have an opinion about everything. And you're like, Abby, how could you be controlling? You don't have opinions. I know, I know that's what you're thinking right now, but believe it or not, I know it's hard to tell, I have opinions about everything. <laughs> I want to control everyone, how they're driving, how they dress, uh, how the how our government should be run right now. I, you name it, I got lots of opinions and I would love to take over. Okay? Yeah, I know. So, and I'm breathing because I'll get, you know, I got to breathe through it. Breathe through it with me. Breathe through it with me if you're like me. Okay, <laughs> here you go. So this person will likely tell you what to do a lot and you get especially annoyed because you know, you know when you're just about to do the thing, and then they remind you, literally sometimes as you're doing it, and this happens sometimes with my son or someone, like I'll remind them to bring something with them somewhere. I, you know, it's hard for me not to, it really is. Oh, I'm having a headache just thinking about it. My teenagers, and I think it's a little different with teenagers, I will say this, only because they don't have all their executive functioning yet. But with adults, and even with teenagers, I try to let them have some consequences and have to deal with it. Um, we were going to an appointment the other day with my son, Max, and and I just, I didn't, I made myself not tell him to bring things. And sure enough, we got in the car, there was no water, he didn't have a cell phone, he didn't, you know, but I, I refused to turn around. That's the boundary there. I, we were already on the way and I said, I'm not turning around. You know, you you forgot everything. You're gonna have to figure out a way to remember these things. I'm not changing what I'm doing for you. And that's a key that I'll talk about in a little bit when I talk about what to do. Um, with people who are controlling, but also it's my way to deal with my own controlling behavior is to have boundaries. But that's something you're going to do with people who are controlling in general. But I'll, I'll get there in a minute. So, uh, so these, fo <laughs> so there's a lot of direction. There's a lot of bossiness. What, what could be, you know, and I call myself your bossy Jewish mother all the time, right? I, I again, pretty self-aware about my bossiness. There. <laughs> 
They're also often thinking of like every eventuality and future tripping. So they might be planning things down the road that make them seem like a worry wart or a doomsayer, right? Because they're trying to prevent future negative things happening, but it's controlling behavior. So, uh, yeah, I know. It, this I also see this in just overprotective parenting, you know, what we call like a helicopter parent. And obviously it can look like just straight up nagging all the time, right? You know, uh, how much are you eating? Did you exercise today? You know, all that kind of stuff is controlling, really controlling. Okay. And then the sixth category, which is a place I had to really dig deep. I told you I had to dig deep into my own personal issues. And I, I literally in my therapy, I told my therapist, I said, hey, I'm, I want to do this episode on controlling behavior. Here's what I've divided up. What do you think of these categories? And at the time, I only had five. This is how unself-aware I can be. And I'm outing myself right now. So be kind. Um, and she laughed and she said, what about what you do all the time? And I'm like, me? I already said it. I'm a little bossy and controlling and, you know, I can get kind of judgmental in my head nowadays, not so much out, out of my head, but I get out of my head too. And she said, oh no, you need, you need a sixth category, which is the I'll do it myself category. <laughs> That's controlling. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I feel like I've done all this work on myself and how did I miss that? I was, we were cracking up together, which is the good news. I couldn't believe I missed it. I thought, oh, how on earth did I miss this big one? So the, the, uh, so the last part of that continuum on the other side of the physically abusive, you know, yeah, is this, uh, this is the other end of the spectrum, right? Is the person who won't accept any help. <laughs> They just want to do it all themselves. I know. That's so me. It's so me. <sighs> I'm taking a breath. I'm breathing it in. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. See, and then this opened up a whole lovely thing in therapy, which I'm working on now, that I wasn't really working on this way before. So thank you. I always say how much the podcast helps me in my personal life doing it. And there's a good example of it i can't and it's so shocking to me like talk about face palming i thought how on earth did i not come up with that obvious category i get offered help all the time by gary my family people i say no all the time i got it it's okay and so i will say this the i can do it myself can come across you know very nicely it's okay i already did it i i do that a lot i used to be in the second category but i really am not anymore i've so i've done enough work that i'm not in that category the second one which is the passive aggressive one uh i'll just do it myself since no one around here can ever do it right yeah that category and i will say there are times when i accept help i'm really i'm getting deep on myself aren't i yeah i'm going there i'm going there i'm going to start whispering there are times when I have got, I've let someone help, but then I go back and I change it and I fix it the way I want it because they didn't do it the way I wanted. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Done it. Done it. Checklist for Abby. I really try to stop myself from doing that. It, it, it was more when the kids were little because, you know, they would want to help and you'd want to help. You want them to help. You want to teach them how to wash dishes and how to do things, right? But then they don't do it very well. And you're like, you know, washing a pan afterwards. But these days, if if my children, um, my teenagers, you know, blow off something, I kind of come back and I'm like, look at the pan. Would you want to cook in that pan? <laughs> like, let's have some level of cleanliness. And this obviously can also go into my perfectionism and needing things in an exact way. So, uh, you know, we've we've had discussions about what to me is just something I need because I use the pans versus maybe how clean they keep their room, which is somewhere they sleep and they have to deal with. So if I don't have to have bugs in that room, you know, as long as there's no bugs or other things or, you know, whatever, you, you got to, some of the stuff you have to work out. You have to figure out why do I need this? And is this helping them as a human overall? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. You know, you just, is it you just you being controlling and crazy or is it not? You know, just try to, try to do some soul searching here. We'll talk about that in the tips, but so... <laughs> Uh, again, and I'll say it again, I'm not talking about relationships on the spectrum that deals with abuse, right? So we're doing run of the mill controlling people who maybe even mean well, but again, it's driving you crazy. And so they're often, and I don't want to say always telling you what to do, but they're often are, 
you know, again, there's two ways of doing things, their way and the wrong way. And the thing they say a lot that is a, is I'm just, I'm just trying to be helpful. <laughs> I was just trying to help. Yeah, that's a controlling person right there. I was just trying to help is a controlling person. So I want to throw that out there. If you say that, I, I know that, I think that came out of my mouth this morning when I was trying to help McCartney with something. So uh, I, I'm with you. I'm here in the battle on both sides of the control issue with you. But th that it's a problem, right? That's controlling. Or, you know, maybe it's just someone you're, it's impossible to have a real discussion with them because they're so rigid and they only believe that their way is right. Okay. So we'll have some examples here. Let me think of some. So in a romantic or a parenting relationship, Controlling behavior is often couched as being helpful, I would say. That happens a lot. Your mom might give you suggestions and advice to, you know, make your life better. Or your partner might tell you the best way to burp your child, you know, right? Just being helpful, trying to help my kid, trying to help you, you know, be easier if you're not screaming. Here's the way they should brush their teeth, you know, that kind of stuff. But I know some of you are listening right now going, that's not controlling. I My child needs to, or they're going to get sick or they're going to not feel good or they're going to cry and scream. And then he's going to, you know, I'm saying he, it might be the other way. Then my partner's going to hand off the baby to me and then I have to deal with it. And if they just burped in the right way, then I wouldn't have to do it. Do you hear yourself? Do you hear it? I know. It's controlling. It, it's about, and I'll get to the tips in a minute. You know, this is about you and your boundaries around this stuff. So I would tell you, and I'll get to it, but I'll just say it now, that you need to have a boundary that you're not going to take the kid if they're screaming, that if they're not listening to you about how you think it could best happen, your child won't die from crying. You know, they'll be okay. And everybody has a different relationship and that's okay too. I think kids become very resilient having to deal with different kinds of things. I think I said this before here that uh, when my kids were little, their dad used to do things like kind of poke at them and tease them and things that made me nuts because I have older siblings. I'm the youngest and I hate being teased. I really hate it. it it's, it's not funny to me. It's not okay. It really, it's a trauma trigger point for me. And I really didn't like it. And I remember him saying, you know, they're going to get teased. They're, it's going to happen. They're going to get poked at in daycare. Like things are going to happen. And... I want them to learn frustration tolerance. And I have to tell you, you know, my sometimes Jewish mother coddling was not always the way to go. So having both was a really good thing. I, I, I don't think I admitted that then, but I'll admit it now. Okay. <laughs> Their dad doesn't listen to the podcast, so it's okay. He doesn't know he was right. Okay. So, so I, you know, I think, I think this is some of the, most difficult type of controlling behavior to deal with when, you know, when they're saying, because they're, again, the response is, I was just trying to help. Because in reality, it's, it's criticism, it's fear, it's manipulation. When you think about it, right? I was just, you know, saying, oh, do it this way. It's because I'm trying to, I am being critical that they're doing it wrong, that there's a right way and a wrong way. There's not. There's 10 ways to burp your kid. There's many different things that could happen and you won't even know what they are because you didn't even try them because you don't think that way. It's fear uh, of keeping your own boundary later and it's manipulative. It is. I know. I say with love because I do it too, but there you go. So they're trying, what's really happening when someone is trying to control you is, and here it is, ready? Drum roll. They're trying to get you to match their expectations of how things should be because they're trying to control outcomes and feel safe. Can you, can you let that sink in for just a second? Can you? I'm going to say it again. People are controlling. Because they're trying to get you to match their expectations of how things should be, quote unquote, should be, because they're trying to control outcomes, because they're looking to feel safe overall. That's why people are controlling at the very end of the day, okay? Now, sometimes controlling behavior is obvious, like in those first um, three categories I mentioned, right? Uh, you know, I don't want you hanging around with that guy or you need to be home by six for dinner every night. You you can't have the credit card. I don't trust you with it. Um, I don't want a wife who works. I heard this recently. 
Uh, you look ridiculous in that. Wear this instead. You know, you're, you're doing that wrong. Can't you do anything right? Maybe, maybe that, right? Let me show you. Or let me, or just do it this way. That's all pretty obvious controlling. I hope it's obvious to you, actually, um, controlling behavior. But I think most of the time, it's harder to identify controlling behavior because it's definitely more understated. So it might be something like, um, uh, or are you sure you want a second helping? Do you think it's a good idea to go out this late? Even giving directions, you know, when people are, <laughs> when you don't ask and they're like, oh, make a left up here, it's quicker route to go this way, go this way when you're driving. That's so controlling, right? Uh, oh, don't, don't chop the garlic that way. Here, here's a better way. As opposed to, again, there might be a better way to chop the garlic, but did you ask? Did you, did, uh, is your child struggling to learn how to cook and, and you can't just let them have some fun with it? You know, like, what, or is your partner finally helping cooking a meal and now you're criticizing the way they're doing it? Well, the, the garlic will be too big and then it'll be bitter in the thing. No, just, you know, can you let that go? <laughs> um, oh, is that what you're going to wear to your interview today? Uh, how many, how many drinks have you had tonight? Did you, did you get to the gym today? Um, these are all less obvious ways people control. Uh, um, oh, oh, my favorite. He should know what I like after 10 years of marriage. She knew that would upset me. That's controlling. I was just trying to help, obviously, right? All right. So let's just, so before I go to the tips, one last thing. I want to just talk about some kind of key traits of a controlling person so you can understand them better so we can get into the tips. First and foremost, control freaks <laughs> really know they are one. They believe they're just helping you with their feedback or suggestions or by finishing something so it's done right. That's it. They don't see their controlling behavior as a symptom of their own issues, of their own anxiety. Okay. And their self-awareness is often very low or they might understand, um, you know, like I used to you know that they're a little controlling, but yeah, I'm a little controlling, but, but there's the, but they still rationalize, you know, oh, but I need to, cause of this, it's the best for everyone, but I have to protect my kids, but I have, but, but, but yeah, no, that's not how you get to do it. A anxiety is really at the root of all control issues, even, even violence. It's, that's what's at. That's what's at the, the bottom of it, trying to be in control. This anxiety that they're having for whatever reason in whatever situation makes them feel internally out of control and that drives them to find something to control, right? To make themselves feel better. And in some sort, they wanna feel back in some sort of power and usually that thing to control is you or the things around you or what you're doing, right? So this is really important to understand. Controlling people also, they can't understand why you see things differently than they do. They haven't even considered that there's another valid viewpoint on, you know, eating, child rearing, working on a project, how to put the mail in the mailbox. I, I'm, I'm serious. Craziness, right? But really, they haven't even considered it. If you see something in a different way, then, you know, you're just, you're just simply wrong. And if they feel passionately passionately about something and you disagree, then they'll even get more upset. And you might be called stupid or ignorant or immoral or obnoxious or controlling yourself. <laughs> I know. Uh, you'll also hear controlling people say certain kinds of things like, um, uh, a polite people do this, say this, right? That's the only option if you're polite. Rude people always whatever. Loyal people do this and that, say this and that. It's unprofessional to blah, blah, blah. They, and there's that right and wrong. There's one way to do things. And if, if you say you're a professional, that's the way. You got to do it this way. That's the only, only choice there is. So you got to remember that. And you got to remember that controlling people have issues always, always, always with their self-esteem. And they are terrified of being vulnerable. And again, those top three categories I listed, the abusive, the narcissist, that this is true for them, but I don't need you worried about their self-esteem and trying to fix it or anything else, okay? So that's why, like, again, I'm not talking about those top three categories. I'm talking about kind of run-of-the-mill people who, you know, your mother, um, 
you know, telling you how you should, that you should make sure your child wears a hat every time they leave the house. You know, I'm talking about that kind of stuff. So there's just this feeling of, you know, your mom might see you as a reflection on parenting and motherhood and you being a better mother means she was a better mother. You know what I mean? Or again, she has something in her head about that that's the way things are and have to be done. And how dare a child of mine not do it that way. So they, and they don't like getting vulnerable. They don't want that. It's one of the reasons they get really angry when you don't follow their advice. When you don't do what they've said, you know, this is the right way and you don't do it, their self-esteem takes a hit. So they lash out. Uh, you know, why do I even waste my time giving you advice when you never listen? You know, why Why do I, this kind of stuff. They are feeling, again, kind of more brittle. Their self-esteem is lower. I know it seems like people who boss and tell people what to do all the time have very high self-esteem, but trust me, it's the opposite. You don't feel a need to control other people when you feel really good about yourself. You just don't because they don't bother you which is going to be one of my tips, so we'll get there. So let, let's get to the tips. Enough already, Abby. Let's get to the tips. But I, I want you to have always, you know how I do the podcast, I always want you to have a context for what I'm talking about. I want you to have an understanding for what I'm talking about. Otherwise, and this is why I really rail against those, you know, 30-second tips or one-minute tips that people give, which I try to give occasionally on Reels and Instagram and TikTok or wherever, just because it's like, neat. you have to do it. I got, you know, I, I, I do it minimally, but... I do play that game, so to speak, but I do it very little because I don't really believe in it. I, I don't, I think there's very few things like that that you're going to do forever. Every now and then you hear something and you're like, wow, got it. But that's more rare. Um, and so I think you need background and context and understanding and hopefully some compassion about the other person and, you know, a little insight. I think those things are what help us really change behavior long term. So, okay. So let's talk about my five ways if you're on youtube i'm going to put up a five <laughs> five ways to deal with a controlling person okay here we go five ways ready number one and you're going to hate them all by the way let me just say that now you're not going to like these i, I don't think so i say it with love please keep listening but get yourself ready to maybe not love them okay but they're the right ones because <laughs> i'm bossy and controlling all right, number one, focus on yourself. Yeah, see, you didn't want to hear that first. You wanted to hear, what are they doing? What, what does the controlling person have to do? No, focus on yourself. If you believe that the only way to be happy in any relationship is if someone else changes, then you, my friend, are in for a long, long, unhappy friggin' life. Cut that shit out. You know, I don't swear much, but sometimes it's important. You will not change this person, and that cannot be your focus. If you're trying to get them to change, then you're the one with the control problem. I know, interesting, right? Yeah. That's what control is, trying to change someone else's behavior. To make yourself feel better, to make yourself feel safe. Yeah, I know, it's what I just said. Uh-huh. I know, sit with that just for a minute. Yeah. Try. If you're trying to assert, assert control over someone who's determined to pull, hold on to it anyway, it's just pointless. So you gotta step back and check in with yourself. It's up to you to be different. You can't change them. You can only change yourself. I know, I hate, trust me, I hate this so much. Uh, I, what I teach, <laughs> we say all the time, you, we teach what we need to learn. So just know that I've learned a lot doing this episode as always. I, you know, it's like, oh gosh, I, I feel like I should be done by now. I've been working on myself for like 30 freaking years. What more, more, sorry, more, 35 years. Why don't I have this? <laughs> and it is because you never do. You know, every time we reach kind of a new place, there's always room for growth because we're always changing, right? Now I have new relationships and different people I'm dealing with in different situations. And, you know, we always, we have to kind of keep doing that. Now, Things get easier, things become clearer, we have less issues, that's all very true. But, you know, I think that a lot of our stuff from <laughs> that we've had a long time, mine is from childhood, it's it's hard just to say, oh, I'm done with that controlling stuff. It, when, and anybody who tells you that is full of crap. Like, uh, no. Okay, so number two, tip number two. So focus on yourself is one. Two is to identify your boundaries. I'm, and I promise I'm gonna, this, 
this year I'm going to figure out my the book. I have my book written on boundaries. I have to figure out a publisher. I, I just have to get it out there. It has not been on top of my list as I shared a while ago. I think with some of you, I have I had long COVID and a lot of stuff I was dealing with health wise and just trying not to do too many new things at once. So, but I will get to it. I think it's important. A lot of you have written in and asked for this book and it's really good. I'm very proud of it. It's going to help you identify them, all the troubleshooting to deal with them, all the things. Okay. So there you go. But for now, (laughs) I have a lot on the podcast already. Go search boundaries. I already put a lot of free stuff out there. How to stop having guilt and regret when you set boundaries. How to uh, set boundaries and hold them. I have it all. And I'll link again, as always, in the show notes. How to have boundaries at work. I have them all. So when dealing with controlling people, though, you have to know your boundaries and stick to them. Remember, it's not a boundary if you don't stick to it. It's not a boundary to say, don't call me after uh, 10 at night. It's a boundary, it's a standard. You say, don't call me after 10. And when the person calls after 10, you don't answer the phone because it's a boundary. You you don't answer the phone and go, hey, I told you not to call me after 10. That's not how you do it. You already told them, don't call me after the 10. I won't be answering. Guess what? It's already done. When you don't hold the boundary, that's on you. So when you answer the phone after 10, you've just broken your own boundary. You don't even respect your boundary. Why are you expecting other people to respect it when you won't respect it? Seriously. It is, remember, no one else's job to make you happy. It's not their job to hold your boundary. It's your friggin' job. I say with so much love in my heart, your life will change when you stop being a victim. No one but no one who listens to my podcast gets to be a victim ever. And that is my greatest gift to you. I am changing your life. You write in. I get your emails all the time and I love them. I love the reviews. I read them all. It because you get it. When you get this, when it shifts in your brain, your life really changes. It's this is the thing. Uh, So let's say I'm going to give you a couple examples of this. So Let's say Clara, you got Clara at work and she is super controlling. Every time you meet with your supervisor, you know, she's that person who, you know, what, what, what would you guys say? What, so what was going on in there? It looked like he was angry or she was angry with you. When you're uh, working on a project, maybe she wants to, Clara wants to micromanage you and your work. Uh, she often takes the lead and tries to delegate to you and then, you know, follows up constantly to find out what you're doing and point out ways you should do it instead. Maybe Claire's even your boss. It doesn't really matter to me if she's a coworker or a boss or supervisor or team, you know, on your team. Your boundary here is in speaking to her first and letting her know that you don't do well in this kind of work environment. However you want to say that, I have lots of ways to work on communication, all that and other things. And then you got to lay down your boundaries. So you might say, hey, I'm not going to just, I'm, I'm not ever going to discuss with you what happens in supervision, so please stop asking. And then the next time she asks you, ignore her. See, that's what I mean. Hold the boundary. You don't have to get upset. You don't have to get crazy with Clara. You just have to, you just have to ignore her. If you just stare at someone when they ask, you'll be amazed at how quickly they will remember. They're, at first, they'll be like, huh? You'll just walk away. Just walk away. Just literally don't say a thing. And I've done this with my kids. I've done this with many people. And sometimes... Um, when they come after you and you feel like you have to say something, I, I'll i just say, I've already talked about this with you. I'm, I'm never going to talk about this with you. So just letting you know. That's it. And I just walk away. I'm not going to debate it with them. I'm not going to, they might say, what are you talking about? I don't even know. It's like, just walk away. They know. Trust me. They know. They're bullshitting. They know. Uh, if you're working on a project with Clara, right? Again, or if she's your boss or a coworker, lay out the boundaries. I won't be answering emails between 8 p.m. and 7 a.m. I'll uh, I'll check in with you every Friday by email with updates on progress, not before. Or we'll have an in-person meeting every Monday, and I'll, but not before. And then if and when, we know it's a when, right? Clara tramples your, or tries to trample your boundary, again, either ignore her or remind her, but stick to your guns. Reminder. Yeah, I don't answer emails after 10. But this was an emergency I sent. Don't, I wouldn't even say another word. I would just stare at her. You've already said it. Stop repeating it. Just nod your... I always nod my head a little. If you're watching me on, you, on YouTube, you see. <laughs> I'm sort of nod my head a little. I'm like, mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing else to say. I've already said it. People run out of steam and go pick on someone else. I'm telling you right now. Sometimes it takes... A few efforts of these and then sometimes they do really well for a while and then they come back at you but again if you're not a victim then it's fine they come back at you and you deal 
Uh, another example could be family. Um, I just had this recently with a client. Um, her mom was very focused on an extra 20 pounds she's carrying. Okay. So, and her mom will forward her emails about diets. Her mom for her birthday signed her up for a gym membership that she paid for for the year. Um, at, ga at family gatherings, she always mentions like, she'll say, oh, I cooked these low carb options for you. Or she teases her or says something when she takes a second helping, like she's all over my client's food. And so my client had to tell her, it's, I'm not okay with you mentioning anything about my weight, my food or exercise. And she said, you know, I know you love me. I know you're trying to help. I get it, but it's not helpful. And it's really going to ruin our relationship if you keep focusing on my weight. So I'm telling you now, I'm fine. I got it. I understand. Trust me. No one knows better than me that I have weight I'd like to lose. So you talking to me about it is not helping. If it was helping, I'd be thin by now, I guess. And I'm not. So this is what she said to her. It was so good. She said, so please, I love you. I want to have a good relationship with you. And this is ruining it. That's what she said to her. And the mother, of course, you know, was like, well, I don't understand. I'm just trying to help. She did the, I'm just trying to help thing. And my client did so well. And she just stuck to it. She said, I'm telling you what I'm, what's happening. It, like she didn't argue with what her mother said. She didn't like, well, here's why. Nothing. Just that's it. That's it. Be clear. She just was clear. You're not to say a word to me, no matter how helpful you think it is. And then she said, she laid out her responses. Remember, it's not a boundary unless you have a response that you're going to stick to when the person doesn't hold your standard, right? It's just a standard otherwise. So, and she said, if you send me things by email anymore, I'm going to block your email. So she said to her, I'm going to start blocking it. She said, and if you continue to talk about my food with me, I'm not going to come here for holidays or meals anymore. Just don't cook me anything special. I'll ask you if I want something, okay? Don't help around this. Just love me. That's what she said to her. Just love me. Just love me for who I am and how I am. Just be as supportive and loving as you can be. I know you think you're supporting with your, because her mother immediately jumped in, like she could see her, like, I am supporting, I'm giving you tips. You know, she said, just be as loving and supportive as you can in the rest of my life and leave this alone. And she did have to, um, I can't remember, it wasn't blocking her email. She had to do something else though. But she did, she just, oh, she just didn't, um, she started deleting the emails that came from her mother after that without reading them. And then something came up because her mother said, hey, I, I emailed, this was like eight emails in. She said, I emailed you about some party that they were going to for a family member. And she said, oh, I started deleting your emails after you sent me that one, remember I told you uh, about weight. So I haven't been reading them. I don't read your emails anymore. She said, so if you want to say something to me about, you know, a party we're going to or something else, you're going to need to start texting me that or telling me in person. And again, I just want to remind you, if you start sending tips that way, I'm going to block your phone number. Like she was just very gangster about it and did such a great job. She remembered that you can't act like a victim or blame, you know, your partner, your boss or your parent for what they're doing. If you don't like something, it is your responsibility to change what you're doing. Your happiness is 100% on you. I know it's nice when people are nice. I know it's really wonderful when they respect our boundaries. I like it too. But you can't focus on that. You have to focus on yourself and you keeping your boundaries. That's how you deal with controlling people. You focus on you, not them. Every time you think of them, oh, I hate that they do that. Oh, it's driving me crazy. Th think about yourself. What can I do? What should I be doing to hold a boundary? The third thing, tip I'm going to give you is don't get, and this will, if you're doing one and two, three will happen naturally, okay? Which is not getting into a power struggle. Control freaks love a good power struggle. <laughs> they know they're right. They can't wait to prove their point to you. They are excellent at arguing their points and can suddenly seem like, you know, like high powered Harvard trained lawyers. It's unbelievable. Your opinions, okay? otherwise known as your feelings and boundaries, <laughs> will get lost, that's what they call them, right? You have a feeling or a boundary, they, it's called your opinion, will get lost or demolished in their excellent wordsmithing, in their clever language, in their domination, whatever. So you're never going to win if you get into a control tug of war with them. So don't play the game. 
<laughs> this is why laying out your boundaries is so important. When you do one and two, it helps this. If they continue their behavior, your job, again, is just to follow through on what you said would happen when you stated your boundary. That is how you don't get in a power struggle about it. It's a beautiful thing. And that brings me to four and five. They're connected a little bit. Number four is this, and this is going to blow your mind a little because this might not have even occurred to you. I know. Figure out why you care. Think about this just for a minute. Let that sink in. This is the hardest part of all this, okay? It really is. Why do you really care that someone else is trying to control you? It doesn't mean you need to let them. So why are you so upset? Really, why are you so upset? There are times when strangers try to control me and I could care less. But when my mother would say something when she was alive, God bless her soul, I'd go from zero to 60 in two seconds. And I have a, let me give you a great example because I love you and I'm outing myself today all over the place. So my mom and I are, my mother is, was, you know, I've shared with this, she was a narcissist and she had a lot, uh, she was very focused on how I looked. Very, very focused on how I looked. And would pick it apart a lot. And, but she would often comment about my hair. She never liked my hair. When it was straight, she wanted it curly. When it was curly, she liked it straight. It was long, she wanted it short, you know, always, right? Actually, she always wanted it long. She always said it should be long. So, <laughs> so one time we were in a nail salon together and the woman doing my, I was sitting next to my mom. She's getting her nails done. I'm getting mine done. And the woman doing my nails said, um, uh, oh, I, I love, um, oh, I had a barrette in my hair. I had it off my face, Okay. I had a barrette, my hair was off my face. And she said, oh, I love your barrette. You, you, you know, it looks beautiful. It frames, your hair is framing your face so nicely, you know, the way you have your hair back. And my mom said, and I was, and I said to her, I said, oh, thank you. That's so kind to say, right? It was. <laughs> my mom said, I tell her all the time that she should have her hair back, that everyone should see her face, that she shouldn't let it hang there. And she gets mad at me whenever I say something. I can't believe you could say something. She didn't get upset. She's always mad at me. And I have to tell you, I had a moment. She was, my mother was 100% right. Every time my mother would comment on my hair in any way, I would just be like, stop commenting on my body. You know, I would like drop the, you know, drop the anchor, right? Now, granted, that was a way, the only way I knew to hold my boundary with her for many years was to um, just have a no, a zero tolerance policy about talking about my looks, okay? So, you know, this is kind of an extreme thing where the narcissism was there and this is the way I could deal with it, was just telling her that. And of course, she would often trample over my boundary or try to and talk about my hair or something else or, oh, did you just get a cut? Oh, you know, or something, whatever. And it was, you know, it's a lot of gray area sometimes. Yeah, I did just get my hair cut, but I don't really want to talk about it with you. You know, it's hard. This stuff is hard, right? Boundaries can be, you know, they're not so black and white. Anyway, but it really pulled me up and I thought, why do I care so much when she says those kinds of things? Like, oh, you're so pretty when your hair's off your face. Why was that getting me as angry as when she said that I should lose weight or I wouldn't be able to keep my husband? I know, she said that to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, it became hard to sort of find space or even when she said that to me, you know, you're gonna, if you don't lose weight, you know, you're not gonna keep, you know, uh, Gary's gonna leave you. Like, Gary's not leaving me. And by the way, he loves how I look. He loves my body, God bless him. Uh, it's so not true. What am I even worried about? Why was I so upset? And as I worked on myself and as I worked on forgiving her and as I did my work, my work with my therapist and my stuff, I ended up being much more gracious with her and I was able to really let so much go that I realized was not, I didn't have to die on every hill. You know what I mean? I, I didn't have to die on every hill anymore. And yes, every now and then she would go a little too far and I'd have to say something. But the, you know, the majority of the time I realized I didn't, and it was that, that thing that happened in that salon that really, that made me take it back to therapy, that gave me an aha moment where I thought, wow, I'm really, you know, so you gotta figure out why you care so much that Clara at work is controlling. What, why is it bothering you so much? She's not, let's say she's not your boss. She's just some team member. She's annoying, whatever. Like don't, you don't have to let her annoy you. You can just draw your boundaries with her and be clear and move on. If it's your boss, you can still draw your boundaries. You can still, or you can start looking for a new job or whatever you need to do to not let this thing bother you so much. 
You can always do cognitive reframing. I did whole episodes on that. There's a lot of ways to look at things to shift your perspective on it. So figuring out why you're so upset about someone being controlling is your first thing. And usually it's because we believe it means something. So if, or like if you're, uh, I have a client whose parents are very controlling about where she goes to school and they are not going to pay for college unless she does a certain degree. I've had this with other clients too. And I said to her, you know, it's their money. They're allowed. Like they're allowed. It's up to you. Do you, do you, it's not great. I, I'm with you. I don't love that they're doing this, but don't go to school for a degree that you really hate to please them like what what is your thing you know wh- what are you doing here you always have and she's saying i don't have a choice i'm like sure you have a choice you could pay for i nobody paid for my schooling i paid for it myself if you know if i said if you didn't have parents who had money how would you, you telling me you wouldn't go to school you wouldn't go to college is that what you're letting me know and she was like oh i said yeah lots of people go to college who have no money of no parents who are paying so if you really want to do that do that otherwise find a way to talk to them about what the other options are or I don't know, you know, figure it out. But, you know, it's really about why is this upsetting me so much, you know? And she wasn't feeling like a good daughter. She was like, there was so much attached to that and um, how she feels like her parents held really high standards for her that she could never reach. And there was just all kinds of things um, where she had a difficult time finding her voice. And so this was just driving her nuts. And they are controlling and it's true. And they had been her whole life. And you know, now you know different. So what are you going to do now? And I will tell you that being mindful and self-aware is, these are your best tools when you're dealing with a controlling person. It's only like in that moment that I was mindful in that salon with what my mother was saying. And I was very self-aware of how I was feeling and my reactions. I was mindful in the moment. I could feel myself. I could have that self-awareness. It's only from that place that you can identify what's happening and find the compassion to lovingly detach from what the other person is doing. It's only from that place. So I'm going to link, as always, to I have my mindfulness starter kit. I will highly recommend that. I will, again, link to all the blogs on mindfulness and self-awareness. Go do that. And then number five is to practice loving detachment. And oh, that's what you want to do overall. That's the big overarching picture of all this is you want to practice loving detachment with any controlling person. And this means that you don't take what they're saying or doing personally. And I know that's harder with a parent than it is with Clara at work, but you got to work on it. Loving detachment is about engagement with your boundaries. That's what that is. It's based on, it's not based on how I feel about you. It's based on It's about how I feel about myself in relation to you, right? That's what's coming up. And you want to do your best not to be full of resentment and frustration when you're dealing with people. And instead, you want to find the compassion and you do that with loving detachment. For me, I try to remember that the other person is hurting. You know, I, my, you know, they're doing the best with the tools they have. I say that a lot, but they're hurting, and that's why they're being so controlling. There is something here under the control that's important, and it's not about me. It's about them. So hold your boundaries, but do it with a loving heart. And I will link to the entire episode I did on loving detachment. I don't want to get all into that now. I have the three uh, three steps to loving detachment. I'll link to that so you can go listen or read or whatever you want to do. But that's really the key is that through all this with a controlling person, and again, I'm we find compassion. And when we're talking about those extreme cases, I, I want to be clear that compassion is different than sympathy. I talk about this a lot, right? It, there's like, you don't, you know, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to fix anything. When you have compassion, you just are. You just feel it. You just know it. And then you take care of yourself and do what you need to do, right? You focus on yourself. With sympathy, we, we focus a lot on taking care of another person, which makes perfect sense if someone, you know, if uh, if Clara at work comes in and says that her mom died today and she was really close to her mom and she's at work bawling, I would hope you'd have some sympathy. I would hope that you would say, is there anything I can do? You know, can you go home? Is there something I can take over today for you or this week? You know, it sounds like you have to go take care of yourself. That's fine. That's lovely. But that shouldn't be all the time, Right. It's when there's some kind of bigger situation that calls for that. 
Otherwise, it's just compassion. It's like, oh, God. And, and I'd like you to have compassion as well as sympathy for Clara when she's going through that, right? But the compassion part is just, oh, my, you know, feeling that feeling, the empathy. Oh, oh, such a, such a loss. I, I feel how hard this loss is. That's it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to go anywhere. You, you know, it's just being in that space with that person for a moment and then moving on. And then moving on. So loving detachment is just that. Detachment we don't want. That's that's that, you know, sort of avoidant attachment style that is uh, walls. That's all that. Loving detachment has the compassion, the humanity, the love, the kindness, the, the patience in it. And that's really what we want. When we're dealing with controlling people, we want it for ourselves and we want it for them. Okay, that is it. That is another episode, my lovelies, in the can. Yeah. So there you go. That is how to deal with controlling people. Those are my five ways. Those are all the ways I think people can be controlling. I, as always, hope today was really helpful to you. As always, it's it's incredibly helpful to me to be here with you. I'm so, so grateful for our relationship, for you spending time. And there's a lot of places you could be listening right now or other things you could be doing, and you're here with me. And that means a lot. So I love you so deeply. I am wishing you a week of patience and calm and compassion. All right, I'll see you soon.